Hi, I'm Kevin Sampsel here at the Writers Dojo in Portland, Oregon. We're here to talk with Steve Allman, best-selling author of Not That You Asked. You know, you have a list of places you're teaching and workshopping and stuff like that. Right. Um, is, uh, is that um, just as important to you as writing? Or is uh, it a source of survival? Well, hmm. I mean, most people, most writers uh, take some kind of patron, so they usually take the academy. I mean, like, I think, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the people who are publishing books, certainly literary fiction or nonfiction, work at a university, which is great. They get health care, they get, you know, salary, they have time for institutional support. Um, I'm not good at that kind of thing. I love the teaching part of teaching, but all the committee work stuff, is, it's not, doesn't play to my strong suit. So I have just been hustling, literally, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. hustling. Um, and uh, so one of the things I do is to get out the desire to teach and also to um, be able to, to make some money is to, uh, to go and teach at Tin House or other conferences or universities. And it's great because I have about a day's worth of interesting and profound seeming things to say about craft and um, stretched over a semester that can get pretty grim. But in the short setting, it tends to work. So I just unload all the smart things I have to say and then I get out of town. So. And so do you have a regular uh, school that you teach at during the course of a regular school year now? I don't. No, no, no. I left, um, I taught at Emerson for a while as an adjunct. You know, the whole adjunct racket, it's, you know, they essentially, unless you get a tenure track job, I mean, every writer knows this chapter and verse, you spend so much time trying to make money as an adjunct that you don't have enough time left over to do your work because if you're teaching well, it's, pre it's pretty emotionally, intellectually draining. And so then because you don't have any time to write a book, you're never going to get off the tenure track little habit trail. Mm -hmm. So I sort of figured that out a few years ago and thought I, I saw myself working four or five classes at two or three different colleges and just said, I'm never going to write uh, anything more than the shitty stories I'm writing now unless I get serious and devote some time to the writing. So um, I kind of stepped away from that. and. And now I just cobble it together through freelance stuff, some of which is just abject, horrible copywriting for stupid magazines, basically. Wow. So that's how I cobble it together. And part of it is teaching, and I'll also do manuscript consultations occasionally, uh, and doing freelance stuff. And you know, and at the end of the year, I get like 35 1099s. And <laughs> uh, you know, we are at this point spending more money than we. Are making and so uh, we'll soon lose our home and but I'm glad you asked <laughs> um, and so it's something now that I'm married I have a couple of kids I absolutely think about it all the time how much every writer does how much time do I have to commit to the things that make money that are sort of commercial endeavors and how do I make those bearable so that I can buy myself the time to do the interesting work I want to do so that just goes on yeah. and on and there is that big story about how you resigned at Boston College, uh, mainly because of uh, Condi Rice coming to speak at the school. Well, yeah. I'll just give a little bit of background so it's clear. So, so I was on book tour in Portland, actually, and I got an email from uh, the department at BC. I had just been an adjunct, so I taught a class or two, uh, you know, a term. Um, and it said, hey, Condoleezza Rice is coming to be our commencement speaker. She's going to give given an honorary degree and uh, we should do something about it. And I was already somewhat deranged. I'm on book tour with Juliana Baggett, who I wrote this novel with, and that in and of itself is a whole telenovela. You know, we were kind of, you know, had a tempestuous relationship. I love her, but it was complicated to be on book tour together. And, we're, and my wife was pregnant and living across the country from me, and I needed to buy our new house, and I had put bids on two houses illegally, as it turns out. And so <laughs> it was legal action stuff happening. So it was a very chaotic time. And the point I'm trying to make is I didn't give a great deal of thought to, I sort of said, somebody, that's, that's bullshit. And Juliana said, well, why don't you write a letter to the Boston Globe if you're so mad? Because she knows <laughs> how to get under my skin. I said, I will, I'm going to. And so on an airplane, actually, weirdly enough, since we're in Portland, the same flight that Charles D'Ambrosio was on 
while Juliana and Charlie are talking. I'm sitting there writing this letter. Dear Doc, you know, what is he? He's a priest, I guess. Father Leahy. Uh, you know, you shouldn't invite a lying crook to be your moral exemplar for your, uh, you know, for your students, and I resign my post. It was a purely symbolic way. Like, I figured, one, the Boston Globe would never run it, and two, that if it did, like most other sort of political gestures in this culture, unless some celebrity's tits were involved, it was not going to make a big, it, was, it wasn't going to be a big deal. Um, and so it was very unexpected when the Globe actually ran it, and then it got on the internet, and then all the right-wing people found it. And those people are all so um, deeply fraudulent, and they're so deeply threatened by anybody who expresses a genuine morality about the state of the country that it just makes them ape shit. That's why they went after Cindy Sheehan, who's a widow, you know, or oh, she's the... So I kind of became the mini Cindy Sheehan for a couple of weeks and was on Handy and Combs and all these things. And my attitude was, what I was hoping was ha would happen is that other faculty would resign. This is how s stupid I was. I thought it would be, I was kind of like Custer, you know, like, charge, let's go. And I assumed that, I guess I just had a, a notion that maybe, maybe finally some part of the Bush re regime would be held to account in a public setting. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if... Condoleezza Rice were humiliated publicly for lying so many times about this matter that involves so many Americans and Iranians getting killed and disfigured emotionally and physically. Uh, but that did not happen. Instead, I just became the right-wing hate machine's kind of chew toy for a couple of weeks. No, I lost the opportunity to teach kids at BC, which was a great gift. I loved it. Um, and I, that's, in all seriousness, why I teach, because when somebody brings in a story they're basically bringing in the most personal thing they possibly could. It's the most interesting thing they could tell you about themselves, no matter how they disguise it. It's all their obsessions and their central emotional preoccupations and pain in one little package. So that's a pretty, um, it's a great privilege and honor to have a bunch of 22-year-old kids place that kind of trust in you and for you to start to suggest to them that that's, that's really what matters in their lives, that bad data of their hearts. So uh, I missed that a lot. And the worst moment of that entire thing was doing a reading a, a month later or so and having this sweet kid, it was in Salem, uh, Massachusetts, having this sweet kid come up afterwards, kind of like gawky, tall, college-y kind of kid, and say, uh, hey, uh, I was going to be in your class next semester, you know, and, uh, you know, I forget what he said, but it was kind of like, I'm disappointed that you're not going to be teaching there. And I thought, oh, great. You know, Sean Hannity, that big erection, uh, got a, you know, managed to get a, a five minutes of dumb shout TV off of me. And this is actually what I gave up, is the opportunity to teach this kid. So, but it was also a gut thing. Like, here we are in this eight-year moral neurasthenic haze of the Bush years, and is anybody going to do anything to say, we're better than this, we don't behave like this, we've got a real mm -hmm. moral compass. So it was not a, like a, it wasn't a well-planned out decision, it was just a kind of moral spasm, like, ugh, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't send this message. And from BC's part, it didn't do a thing to change BC, you know, I don't think it affected them at all. Um, so. But it's a, it's a weird thing because the opportunity to have that experience to teach kids and then the relationship you have morally with their administration, those are almost in two different worlds. So I'm sorry I don't teach there. I like those kids a lot, so mm -hmm. I, I miss that. Well, thank you for uh, spending time with us. Absolutely. The Writers Dojo. Yeah. And uh, once again, this is Steve Almond. I'm Kevin Samsel, and thanks for watching. All right.